Listen to the Vibes. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I'm very happy to welcome Amanda Blackwood here. She's a speaker, an author, an artist, and a survivor. So we're going to get to know her and have a great conversation. So, Amanda, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hi, Kyle. Um, I'm married to a Kyle, so that's where I want to start. Uh, <laughs> there's something about the name, man. He's the best man I've ever known in my entire life. <laughs> I am very happily a wife. I am a believer in God and country, and we have five cats. Last time I did an interview, we had six. So there's some recent bad news too. Aww. But with everything bad that happens, there's always something good, right? And we have to learn to look for those good things, even in the darkness. And that's where my story really began. So I read that you were a victim of human trafficking? I was. Oh I was God. a victim of human trafficking three separate times and three completely separate incidences. Oh, no. Um, do you we, mind talking about it? I don't mind at all. So the average number of times that somebody gets trafficked is actually seven. And I've had people come to me and say, well, if you were trafficked the first time, didn't you learn anything? That's like asking a woman, Did, didn't you learn anything the first time you got raped? Because essentially that's what it is. It's a very harsh way of looking at things to blame the person who has this repeatedly happened to them. What we do with ourselves and our brains is when we go through a traumatic event, we start to build these neural pathways of familiarity. We react in new ways. We do new things. We're drawn to de these similar experiences. That's essentially what it was. So with most victims of human trafficking, we grow up with massive amounts of the abuse in our own childhoods. I'm no stranger to that. The first time I ever remember ever being molested, I was only four. My father was physically abusive. My mother was mentally and emotionally abusive. And my brother, who was three and a half years older, was my first molester. Oh. But when you're four years old and you feel like there's nobody that's going to be there for you, you can't tell anybody what happened because for one, you're four and you don't really have the words to be able to tell anybody what happened. Who do you turn to? You tend to turn inward. You know, you believe that you can't trust these people. You can't tell them things. You can only rely on yourself. It's a really harsh lesson to learn at four years old, but that's exactly what happened. So I grew up with this repeatedly happening. For some reason, it, it wasn't as though, a lot of people would say it, it seemed like I had maybe a bullseye painted on my back. I was an easy target. But it wasn't as though I was shouting from the rooftops, hey, to come and take advantage of me, I'm easy to take advantage of. It was exactly the opposite. I blocked people out of my life. I wouldn't allow anybody to get too close. But abusers... And manipulators will seek out people who seem to have some sense of, of loss or something missing in their lives. And it doesn't matter what you perceive your own existence to be. Those people will absolutely exploit you every single time. They will hone in on what these things are that are missing. So I was molested again at 12, again at 13 by an uncle by marriage. Again, at 15, by a stranger in a video store uh, uh, rental parking lot. Again, at 16. Again, at 17. At 17, I was actually raped by somebody I thought was my best friend. So by the time I was 18, I'd been running away for several years. I was constantly putting myself in these dangerous situations, but it was because I was constantly facing dangerous situations. I saw my odds of being out there on the streets and being homeless as better than being at home. In all of my running away experiences, at one point, I left the state where I had been living. My father retired from the military in Utah, and I ran away with three other kids in a two-seater car, and it took us four days to get down to Phoenix, Arizona, because the car was so loaded down, and we really, we were not good travelers. Nobody is at 15, 16, 17 years old. <laughs> we got all the way down there, and I was ditched on the side of the road. I had known people many years before that I knew had moved to kind of that area, Phoenix. And I reached out to them. I found them in a phone book. 
And I had to call several people with their same last name before I reached them. But I finally reached out to them and said, hey, you know, I'm here and I'm stuck and I don't know what to do. Boy, were they surprised to hear from me. (laughs) So they came and got me and they took me in and they took care of me. And eventually they did exactly what all the police did all of those years that I was running away. And they dragged me back home. Nobody really asked questions. This isn't something that people did back then. When I was 17 years old, I was placed into a foster home and I spent my 17th birthday in a foster home um, with a family who was made up of two teachers and three children. And it was the first time I'd seen and been 100% immersed in a proper functioning home. And a lot of people have a, a completely opposite experience with foster homes. I mean, there's no denying that that system is very broken, needs a lot of work, needs a lot of help. But those people, the Tolmans, they were wonderful to me. And I absolutely loved them. And two weeks after I was taken there, the cops came to drag me back home and said there was no evidence of abuse. So there was this constant thing where I was needing somebody to love me. I wasn't feeling like I was getting that anywhere. And the Tolman family never spoke to me again. None of their three girls, the parents, nobody, because they had been told there was no evidence of abuse and I had made the whole thing up. They thought I was lying and they didn't want their children associating with me. Mm. But one family that I had for such a brief amount of time, left such an enormous impact on me that I continually sought that out. When I was 18, I started dating a man that was more than half, more than twice my age. Um, I lived with him for a little while. It was the first time I was ever trafficked. He loaned me out as a birthday prize to his best friend for a trip to Vegas. I was locked up in his hotel room for 52 hours. I couldn't leave. I could get room service, but they had to drop it off at the door and leave before I could get to the door. When I got back from that trip is when I grabbed my stuff and I split. I couldn't do it while I was in in, uh, in Vegas because I didn't have any transportation. He had my ID. I didn't have any way to get back. I had nothing. So when I did get back, I left. That was when I was 18 years old. When I was 19... I was <laughs> under the roof of a young man, a young lady. I call them my landlords because they gave me a place to stay when nobody else would. My family had left me on the side of the streets that time. My, I'd gone to stay with my grandmother and at the last minute she changed her mind, said that they weren't coming to get me and I was on my own. Good luck. And this young couple found me and took me in. They said they had a roof over my head until I could get on my feet. But what they really meant was they could offer me a roof over my head until they could sell me to the highest bidder. They sold me to a man named Esteban. I was locked up for 23 and a half hours with no food, no water, no bathroom facilities. When I got out of that, thank goodness I was a child of the eighties and grew up watching MacGyver and oh my gosh, do I love Richard Dean Anderson. He saved my life. (laughs) I got out and I got out on my own and I left. And this was in Florida. The farthest I could get from Florida without freezing my butt off or having an international passport was California. So that's where I went. While I was in California, I started to kind of gain some ground. I finally got my driver's license. I was 22 years old and kind of trying to find my way in the world. I wanted to be an assistant to somebody important because vicariously, that would mean that I was important, right? Never got there. Instead, I was an actress and a model. I was on Alias and Will and Grace, and I modeled for Harley Davidson, and I did a lot of really cool stuff in my 20s living in L.A. I also got involved in private security. I'd been through enough, and I had gone through enough um, combat training without actually being in combat and self-defense training that I was kind of perfect for what they were needing. And in five months, starting off as the low man on the totem pole, within five months, I had busted open a major embezzlement ring and had taken over. And I was the director of public safety and security in L.A. for six different properties in L.A. County. I did well. But during this time, that's when Internet dating really became a thing. And I got to know this man. 
who didn't live anywhere near me. And we decided that I was way too far away for us to actually have any kind of intimate relationship, but we could be friends. And I shared everything with this guy. I told him my whole life story. I told him all of my challenges. He watched me grow from being that nobody basically living on the streets and living in very poor apartments to living in an apartment on the beach and having my own life and career and car and establishing myself. And he finally asked me to get a fiance visa and to move to Scotland to marry him and be with him for the rest of my life. I was 31 years old. This was 2011. It took him seven years to ask me. It took him seven, de- seven days to start trafficking me once I got there. I nearly killed myself while I was there. He starved me. I went through sleep deprivation, food deprivation, and waterboarding. That's what I call sport torture. It wasn't for any reason other than maybe I didn't obey something he wanted me to do, or he just wanted to see what would happen. Longest I went without sleep was about three, eight and a half days. I nearly committed suicide by train. I was nearly taken out by a severe kidney infection from the abuse. And when I did finally manage to get out of there, it was because of all the years of abuse that had led me to wanting to learn more about psychology on my own more about why our brains do the things that they do. Why do people do the things that they do? I convinced him I had what we used to call Stockholm syndrome. Now we refer to as trauma bonding. And that if he sent me back, he wouldn't have to marry this thing that he'd created me to be. But he wouldn't lose his job as a police officer. And I wouldn't get kicked out of the country. I would be able to come back. But if I overstayed my visa, all of those things would be more likely to happen. I could get kicked out of the country and never be allowed back. And we wouldn't want that, would we? We wouldn't want you to lose your job, would we? And within two hours, it had been five months I'd been there. Within two hours of that conversation, he'd bought round trip flights for me to be able to return in time for Christmas of 2011. And I left. I knew I wasn't going back, but just like in domestic violence, the most dangerous time in somebody's life when they've experienced something like this is the moment they leave. Because that person is already determined. You're not an entity of your own. You are a possession. They own you. And if they can't have you, nobody will. And he hunted me for a long time. He came over to the States. I saw him banging on the neighbor's door one day. He had my address off by one number. I was terrified. When he couldn't find me, he would find where I was working and he would find an email address for that person. And he would take all of these photos and videos that he had taken during the trafficking and he would send them all to this boss, to this friend, whoever I was connected to, and say something along the lines of, I wouldn't want this in my life, would you? I lost friends. I lost jobs. I lost respect. And over a period of five years, I lost every single friend I'd ever had after 14 years in Los Angeles. And I packed up, put my cats in a rental car, (laughs) and I drove from California to Colorado looking for a place to start over. It was in August of 2016. And in August of 2019 is when I discovered that he had made me famous on a pornography website with all of these photos and videos. I found out because somebody asked me for my autograph in a grocery store. It wasn't for modeling for Harley Davidson. It wasn't for being on Alias or Will and Grace or any of the really cool stuff I'd done. And this man had the cojones to show me why he wanted my autograph. It was one of the darkest moments in my life. That November, I was fired from my job when they found out that I was a survivor of human trafficking. I didn't even know what I was. It wasn't until I had gone to an an anti-trafficking conference thinking I was going to help save the kids that I discovered that what I went through was the absolute textbook definition of human trafficking. 
according to the Department of Homeland Security, is defined as the use of force, fraud, or coercion to obtain commercial sex acts or labor from another person. If you break that down, there is no mention of transportation. There's no mention of age. You don't have to be moving from one place to another to be trafficked. Trafficking does not equal being on the roads. Only one quarter of all victims are under the age of 18. What happened to me happened at 18, at 19, at 31. The oldest person in recent years to be pulled out of trafficking was in her 70s. Also, what we hear of in the world of trafficking, people always talk about kidnapping scenarios and kids being followed home from school and being snatched off the streets by greasy weirdos and windowless fans. The truth is that it's not the strangers that are the dangers. The harsh reality is that is only one to 2% of all human trafficking cases. Most people are trafficked by people they already know and trust. Usually it's a significant other, a parent, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle, or even siblings. That's the truth of trafficking. And when I learned that, I was hit in the face with a baseball bat, essentially. I reached out to an anti-trafficking group. One group set me up with legal services to help fight all this pornography off the website. Every time one came down, two more went up somewhere else. I couldn't fight it. I was Sisyphus from Greek mythology, pushing a massive boulder up a mountain and not being able to get anywhere with it. And the other group set me up with a therapist. Uh, first therapist, I traumatized her so bad she has left the industry forever. <laughs> she didn't know how to deal with it. So they had to pair me up with another one, but this other one had already worked with other survivors of trafficking. So she knew what she was doing. And when I went into this meeting with her the very first time, I told her, said, look, I've been through it all. I've had pills forced down my throat. I've used alcohol to numb my pain. I have fought in whatever way that I could possibly find on my own and I can't find anymore. I need help, but I don't need medication. Do not come at me with a Band-Aid. I don't want a Band-Aid. I want a shovel. I want to get to the root of the problem and get it out of me. This is poison and it's killing me. About a year and a half later, as we finished our therapy, is when I wrote my full autobiography in the month of December, 2020. It was 350 pages while I was working two full-time jobs. And she asked me at the end of that, now what are you gonna do? And I said, I have no idea. She said, I want you to try painting. I told her anytime I've ever tried to paint, it looks like a multicolored snowman laying on his side, melting. I don't know how to paint. She said, I don't care if you don't know how. It's not about knowing how. It's about expression. You know how to express yourself with words. I want you to express yourself visually also. Whatever these problems are that boil up, get them out. That's what you came to me asking for help with. You want to get to the root of the problem. You want to get it out. Find a way to get it out of you. And she taught me how to give it a physical body separate from myself so that I could get up and walk away from it. It was one of the most helpful things that I've ever experienced in my life. And now my artwork has sold internationally. A month after my autobiography was published, which was on my 10 year anniversary of freedom from trafficking, which was June 19th, 2021. One month later is when I met the man that's now my husband. You went through all that and yet you were able to find trust in another human being. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was still looking for what the Tolmans showed me. They showed me what it meant to have people who genuinely loved you and care about you and want to spend their time with you. And they're not looking to hurt you and manipulate you and harm you in any way. And that's who he is. And I knew going in that this was going to have to be an incredible person for me to really let down the walls after our first date which was what seven and a half hours long <laughs> and very last minute at that after our first date i knew that he was the one wow mm. i can't imagine i mean i 
I went through some stuff when I was a kid, but nothing like what you've gone through. And I felt, I guess, internally, I felt like a victim for a long time until one day I just got tired of it and said no more. And I let myself get bullied for a long time. And finally, I, one, I don't know what it was. Something one day just snapped and I said, I'm not going to put up with it anymore. But this ain't about me. This is about you. This is about you. It's about all of us. When you experience trauma, it changes your brain. Yeah, it does. We have to go through a grieving process before we can snap out of that. Now, the stages of trauma and the stages of grief are exactly the same thing. So when you go through trauma, you go through denial. At mm -hmm. first, you don't want to accept that this thing happened. Then you go through depression, anger, bargaining. You go through all of this stuff before you finally reach the stage of acceptance. And acceptance often goes hand in hand with that very first step. Again, um, after the denial, you go through depression. You have to accept that this has happened to you. But that depression and that anger, this is grief. You are grieving for the person that you would have been because that person now will never exist. How can you compare that to anybody else's experiences ever? What you went through, whatever it was, is your own experience. It is every bit as bad or good as my own because it changed you. Tell me about when you go out and you speak and do you get to talk to people one-on-one -on -one about the that's that's probably my favorite part. So whenever I do a public speaking event, what I love to do is go early and take a coat with me and mark a chair out to where, you know, I, I can make sure that it's fairly front and center and all the chairs around me are going to fill in and people are going to squish because that's where people always sit. And then I'll leave for a little while and I'll go do whatever because I don't want to sit there forever. I really don't want to have to talk to the total strangers that I'm going to be sitting next to. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> but as things start to kind of fill in and people all start taking their seats and they're getting prepared for the event, I will then go in and sit down with all of the people. And when they say that they're going to have a survivor of human trafficking get up and, and talk on the stage, when they introduce me and I stand up from that seat, I can feel the people around me. You know, and I feel them turn their heads to look at me and go, oh, my. <laughs> You know, it's very dramatic. It's great. Yeah. And I never went, I never was a drama kid in school. I wanted to be, wasn't allowed to be, but <laughs> I love that sense of drama. I've had so many of them afterwards tell me I had no idea I was sitting next to a survivor of human trafficking. I've never met one before. My answer is always that you know of. Less than 2% survive. Of the 2% that do survive, so few are willing to talk about it. So you have to expect that if you're in a group of 100 people, there's going to be another survivor there. And when I get up on stage and I do this talk, I always mention that. Uh, statistically speaking, I'm not alone. There is somebody else here because of the subject matter, because of the numbers that we have. There is somebody else here who's experienced this, and they don't even know that what they went through is called trafficking, just like me. Every single time I've had somebody come up to me afterward and say, I had no idea what I went through was called trafficking every time. And I can get up on stage and talk for 15 minutes or an hour. It doesn't matter. The result at the end is always the same. I am always going to step down off of that stage and wait for whoever it is that needs to have that conversation with me. That's what I do it for. I don't do it because I want to be on stage in front of a bunch of people and I don't want, I don't want to be famous, especially for this. But this is what my purpose is for having survived. This is why I was kept alive. I can't turn my back on that. You know, and I love doing one-on-one -on -one stuff with people. So I'm a trauma recovery mentor and I coach people through all of this stuff and how to pinpoint what their trauma reactions are and understanding what the long-term consequences are of not dealing with them. How do you fight back against that to be able to help yourself to have a better life? I do trauma recovery boot camps with groups. 
this is my whole purpose for life now. My husband is the most supportive person. And I talk about him on the stage all the time too. One of my favorite things to do is to brag about him at the end. You know, I met this amazing, incredibly patient, kind, loving, understanding, overwhelmingly wonderful human being. I adore this man. My life now would not even close to be the same if it weren't for him. And one day we were on our way back from an event and I had just bragged about him. And he told me, he's like, I got to, I got to tell you something like, uh Oh, that is never the fun way to start a conversation. I said, uh Oh, what is it? He said, well, in all my years and all my life and all the places I've been and all the people I've met, you were the only person to have ever accused me of being patient. <laughs> I wanted to know, is there still times that you find that when things are going wrong, you say, why has everything always happened to me? There was for a very, very long time. But there's a lot to being able to reframe your own thoughts when you're dealing with something like that. And I did learn, so what I teach with retra retraining your brain and stepping away from these trauma reactions the only reason I'm able to teach it is because I did it for myself first. I did do that for a very, very long time. But then I started to look back and recognize the good things that happened also. The last time I was trafficked, I was trafficked in Scotland. Yeah, the trafficking was horrible, but oh my gosh, I was in the land of history, you know, and you know, I love history. I was in the land of kings and castles. And every once in a while, when I got out, I got to explore those things. And when I got back from Scotland and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life and how I was going to survive and where I was going to go, the actor Jim Carrey asked me on a date. <laughs> For every monumentally horrible thing that's ever happened in my life, something wonderful has happened to. I was made famous on a pornography website. I got married to the greatest man I've ever known. You have to keep things in perspective. Yeah, there's been a lot of crap that's happened in my life. And there's been a lot of crap that's happened to me. But that doesn't hold me back. And it never will. It can't. I don't give it that kind of power. Well, I don't know what it is about folks like us who have every reason in the world just to feel that everybody's crappy. But yet we still have compassion no matter how bad people have treated us. Why do you think that is? We've been shown by somebody along the way what that means. I think that's a big part of it. There was somebody in your life who showed you what it truly meant to be safe with somebody who says they love you. For me, it was the Tolman family. I, I see not in your head. I, I know you know what I mean. There is somebody. <laughs> you're thinking of somebody right now, somebody who was genuinely there for you and truly loved you. And you know that it made your life better. Yeah. There was a movie that was made in the 1940s with Jimmy Stewart. Probably everybody of our age is familiar with it. It's, it's a wonderful life. Mm-hmm. What a lot of people don't realize was that Jimmy Stewart fought in World War II to such a degree that he had severe PTSD. And in those moments in the movie where he's breaking down and he's crying, that wasn't acting. That was his PTSD spilling out into his real life and showing up on screen. I think that's why so many people who've been through difficult times can really resonate with that movie a little bit more. We feel that. We feel that. But it's just as important to feel the ending, too. And not with the uh, adorable little Carolyn Grimes looking and saying, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. <laughs> That's adorable. That's not what it's about. The story is about how one man, you, has had such a massive impact on 
everybody around. And sometimes it's really difficult to see that. Every once in a while, they might just have the opportunity to show you if you pay attention. Well, do you have a website? I do. I do. My website is growthfromdarkness.com. And there's all kinds of stuff there. It's it's kind of robust. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I do. But yeah, um, probably the easiest way to reach me personally is through the contact form on that website or through Facebook, because if I wasn't on Facebook as much as I am, I would probably have written more than two books a year since 2018. I now have 13 books to my name, but a lot more coming out soon. Um, and what all social media do you have? Oh, gosh. I am on Facebook, primarily, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. I hardly ever use those others. Um, I'm on LinkedIn quite a lot. What else? Gosh, I have my own Amazon page. There's a lot that I do. <laughs> it's a little silly at this point. <laughs> I will put all the links in the description to make it easy for folks to find you. But unfortunately, we've come to the end of the show and I have to thank you, though, for being on my show, and I really appreciate it. Absolutely, and I appreciate you. I love what you're doing, and I love that you're putting your story out there and your voice out there because you're changing the lives of others. That's what we're all here for. Thank you. And I also want to thank all you folks out there. If you are new to the channel, I hope you'll come back. Please hit that subscribe button for my regulars. You guys are awesome because you make it possible for me to do this. And until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.